Good morning and welcome to Christ Central. My name is Owen. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. Um, we were supposed to have our leadership rally this year in the fall, but because of circumstances beyond our control, we had to postpone it. And so today I want to tell you the new date of our leadership rally. It has been rescheduled to January 29th, that's a Saturday, the last Saturday of January, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., Lord willing. Now, the leadership rally is for everyone and anyone who is serving in any capacity at our church or would like to begin to serve if you're not currently serving. Uh, there will be worship, grace stories, encouragement, um, a time to reflect together and pray together, and uh, a light breakfast will be served, a lunch will be served, and some fun prizes will be given away. So if you're serving in any capacity at our church, please register on the planning center, and please plan to join us on January 29th for our annual uh, leadership rally. Uh, this year, we're studying the book of Acts, and the goal of this series is for us as a church to learn from the early church, as we find it in the book of Acts, uh, to learn... Uh, what it means to be the church, like, like to be the church in a biblical sense. A church that's Christ-centered, a church that exalts Christ, a church that is a blessing to our day and place right here in greater Metro D.C. And the title of today's sermon is The Church in Antioch. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 19 to 30. Now, before we read, the first half of chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Peter rehearses, from his own perspective, the story of Cornelius. And you guys remember that story from last week, how Cornelius and his family, his Gentile family and his Gentile friends, uh, were the first to hear the gospel, believe the gospel. They were saved by the grace of God. They received the Holy Spirit. And, and the main point of that story really is told in verse uh, 18, where it says, <clears throat> And they glorify God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now, from this point on in the book of Acts, the inclusion of the Gentiles into the people of God through faith in the gospel will be the main theme for this book. And Paul, who is known as the apostle to the Gentiles, will now be the main actor going forward in the book of Acts. And so that's the context uh, with which we come to our story today. So starting from verse 19. So people of God, this is the word of our God. Would you please give it your careful attention? Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, or to the Gentiles also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named uh, Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Here's the outline for today's sermon. First, the members of the church in Antioch. Second, the ministry to the church in Antioch. And three, the ministry from 
the church in Antioch. Let's start with the members or the kinds of people who made up the church in Antioch. But before we start with the church in Antioch, let's start with the city of Antioch. So what kind of city was Antioch? Well, Antioch was the third largest city in the entire Roman Empire, uh, just behind Rome and Alexandria. It was a very large, a very multicultural, and a very cosmopolitan city. Uh, there were large, there, there were people from all sorts of nations and cultures lived there. Uh, there were large communities of Jews and Greeks and Romans. Romans, Africans, and even Asians in the city of Antioch. And the common language that was spoken in Antioch was Greek, while each ethnic community still had their own languages and their own cultures as well. It was kind of like a greater metro D.C., right? We have people here from all over the world, all sorts of different nations, ethnicities, and culture. And while the spoken language in greater metro D.C. is English, each ethnic community continues to have its own language and its own culture. Now, back in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we're told that the result of the persecution against the church in Jerusalem was that the church was scattered. And as the church was scattered, as it was scattered from Jerusalem, as it went into Judea and Samaria, they went about preaching the gospel. So it was persecution against the church that led to the initial expansion of the gospel. And, and the expansion of the gospel really happened in two ways. First, there was geographical expansion, and there was cultural expansion. So first, the geographical expansion. Now, the preaching of the gospel started in Jerusalem, if we can have the map up. You see, Jerusalem is toward the bottom, right? It says under Judea. So the preaching of the gospel began in Jerusalem, as Jesus said it would. And then where did it go? It went north to Judea and to Samaria, just as Jesus said. He said, remember to his church, you'll be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, and then where? In Judea and Samaria. Okay, and so the gospel is expanding uh, geographically. And now, in our story today, the gospel is expanding even further north, beyond Samaria, all the way up to Antioch. And you'll see Antioch to the upper right-hand corner of this map. And so you see, the gospel was expanding geographically. It was going to the ends of the earth. And, but more importantly, the gospel was also expanding culturally. You see, the gospel began to spread from the Jews to the Gentiles. Now, verse 19 tells us that most of the scattered Jewish Christians from Jerusalem went about preaching the gospel to who? Only to other Jews. So they kept the gospel in-house, if you will. It was Jews preaching the gospel to other Jews. But according to verse 20, there were some of them, not all of them, but some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they got to the city of Antioch, they started to preach the gospel, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles as well. Now, earlier in chapter 11, the apostle Peter had just seen with his own eyes, God save a Gentile centurion, Cornelius, and his Gentile family, his Gentile friends. And so Peter and the rest of the church leadership in the church of Jerusalem, they had realized that the gospel was also for the Gentiles. But up until now, no one had taken the gospel to the Gentiles on a massive scale, the way the gospel had been taken to the Jews. But at Antioch, for the first time, the gospel was taken to the Gentiles on a massive scale. These Jewish believers in Antioch were sharing the gospel with all the Gentiles that would listen to them, with all the Gentiles that they could have conversation with. And so when the gospel reached all the way up to Antioch, and it reached the Gentiles who lived and worked in Antioch. It was part of Jesus fulfilling his promise to the church that they would be his witnesses first in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And I love this. Do you remember when the gospel first went to Judea and Samaria? It was regular Christians, not the apostles, who took the gospel to Samaria and to the half-Jews. And now, in the same way, it's regular Christians, not the apostles, who are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, who are taking the gospel to Antioch and to the Gentiles. And God greatly blessed their new and bold and cross-cultural ministry of the gospel to the Gentiles. Verse 21 says that the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now, we don't know who these Jewish Christians were that first started to share the gospel freely and indiscriminately with the Gentiles. We don't know their names. We're just told that there were men from Cyrus, Cyprus and Cyrene. 
A Bible commentator said this, and I love this. Some of the most significant work of the kingdom has been done by unknown witnesses who are obedient to Christ right where they are and where they do not attract much attention. <clears throat> so as a result, in the church of Antioch, and for the first time in church history, both Jews and Gentiles were in the same church. Believing Jews and believing Gentiles were members of the same church. And this was remarkable because, as you recall, Jews and Gentiles do not associate with one another. They hate one another. They avoid one another. They can't stand to be in the same room with one another. So the power of the gospel was beautifully displayed as the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles was torn down. And as the gospel formed a new humanity, a new human race, if you will, a spiritual race that consisted now of both redeemed Jews and redeemed Gentiles. Now, in the church of Christ, because of the cross of Christ, Jewish sinners and Gentile sinners have received the forgiveness of their sins, and they've been reconciled with God, and they now have peace with God. Also, in the church of Christ, and because of the cross of Christ, Jews and Gentiles are now reconciled with one another, and they can now live at peace with one another. You see, Jews and Gentiles, think about this, who couldn't stand one another, are now sitting together at the same dining table, eating together as family and as friends. That was the power of the gospel at work, and it was a new, remarkable, and beautiful thing. The members of the church in Antioch were Jews and Gentiles who were once enemies, but now, through the power of the gospel, they're friends and they're family. You know, as a pastor, I think about this, and it makes me think. If Jews and Gentiles, who once hated each other's guts, can reconcile and live together in peace in the same family of God through the power of the gospel, then surely we can too. Now, it's been a long time since I gave you all some real talk. I got some real talk for you today. You guys ready? And some of you might get mad at me because of what I'm about to say. And if it hits home, no, that's the Holy Spirit, okay? It's not me, okay? Don't, don't think I'm thinking about you as I say this, okay? It's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. So I just, you know, I, I absolve my hands of any kind of a wrongdoing right now. But here's the real talk. God, our Father's heart is broken. Let me say that again. God, our Father's heart is broken is broken, and it's because of some of you. It's because of some of you. It's because some of you are refusing to reconcile with people in our church family. Just as a father's heart is broken when his beloved children are at odds with one another and they refuse to reconcile, in the same way our heavenly father's heart is broken when he sees us, his beloved children, at odds with one another and refusing to reconcile. Some of you are mad at each other and you haven't talked to one another or had meaningful interaction with one another for quite some time. And this is with people that you once considered your very close friends. Maybe it was over something that happened a few weeks ago. Maybe it was over something that happened a few months ago. Maybe it's something that happened a few years ago. But whatever the case, you avoid one another now and you act as if the other don't exist. You literally act like Jews and Gentiles together and you just avoid each other. Or maybe you've had a falling out with someone uh, over some sharp uh, political differences. Maybe that person was too conservative for you, or maybe that person was too progressive for you. Maybe you got mad at someone because they didn't seem to care about racial injustice enough or even minimize racial injustice. Or maybe you got mad at someone because they seemed to make everything about racism and systemic racism. Maybe it was something personal. Maybe it was a word that was said. Maybe it was an action that was done or not done. Whatever the case, 
whatever the cause, whatever the incident, you now avoid each other and there is unresolved tension and conflict in your broken relationship. And what's worse is it causes other friendships and other relationships to suffer too because people now can't be friends with you and the person that you're in conflict with because then they feel like they have to choose and they don't know what to do. Because the, to befriend one feels like a betrayal to the other and it's a relational mess. And it's so sad and so heartbreaking for me as the pastor of this church to see members of our church family willingly stay in unresolved conflict and tension with one another and refuse, simply refuse for whatever reason, to reconcile. And if it breaks my heart that much, it makes me wonder how much more it must break the heart of our Heavenly Father when he sees us at odds with one another and refusing to reconcile. You know, the power of the gospel is beautifully and powerfully seen and demonstrated when Christians forgive one another, reconcile with one another, love one another, and live together in peace and harmony. Now, that doesn't mean that the person that you're in conflict with, that you and, and that person will become best friends again and that you're going to spend all your time together. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you're going to see eye to eye with that person over every political issue. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that you're willing to forgive one another and to let go of your grievances and to let go of your bitterness that you've harbored in your heart against that person for so long and, and to begin to treat that person with kindness and to want the best for that person. It does mean that you can now humbly ask for forgiveness. It does mean that you can now graciously, graciously grant forgiveness. And it does mean that you can live at peace with one another. It means that you can agree to disagree without losing respect or love or admiration for the person that you disagree with. Do you realize just because you disagree with someone does not mean you have to disdain them? You can disagree agreeably and with respect. And frankly, the older I get, the more it becomes painfully obvious to me that life is just far too short to not forgive. Life is far too short to not reconcile. You know, as Christians, the one thing that we'll never, ever regret on our deathbed is that we forgave people. No one has ever said, I regret forgiving that person. I regret staying mad at that person uh, for all these years. No Christian has ever said that. Do you know what too many people sadly and tragically say? I regret not forgiving that person sooner. I regret that I didn't see him or her for all these years because we never reconciled and because we never made up. And I can't even remember why we're so mad at each other. But we were. And we didn't spend any time together. I'm your pastor, and I hope you know that I love you. And I want the best for you. And what I want for you is not to regret not reconciling with a friend or family member until one of you is about to die. Sometimes I want to say, dude, does it take someone getting cancer for you to reconcile with that person? Does it take someone having to be on their deathbed for you to reconcile with that person? Does it? I want what's good for you, what's truly good for you, and that's for you to reconcile with the people in your life that you've been estranged from, whether family or friends, sooner rather than later. You see, friends, the gospel is not only the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, it is also the power of God for reconciliation for everyone who believes. And so, dear Christ Central family, can I beg you, can I plead with you by the power of the gospel, let's reconcile with people, especially with people in our same church family that you're at enmity with. Let's reconcile for the joy of our Father's heart 
and for the joy of our own hearts as well. Now, before I leave off, I, I do need to say this. Now, this does not mean that you cannot pursue justice when injustice has been committed. We ought to pursue justice and seek to make things right, to address and correct wrongs that have been, uh, uh, that have been committed. Pursuing reconciliation and pursuing justice are not mutually exclusive. In fact, you cannot have true reconciliation without justice. Reconciliation and justice must go hand in hand. But listen to me. We can and we must pursue justice while extending mercy and grace for reconciliation. Otherwise, a merciless and a graceless pursuit of justice will become an injustice itself. So the membership of the church in Antioch demonstrated beautifully the power of the gospel as it took people who once despised one another, Jews and Gentiles, and reconciled them so that they were part of the same church family together. And Christ Central, if the gospel can reconcile Jews and Gentiles, it certainly can reconcile us in the family of God. Amen? Amen. Can you today make it like a personal resolution to like not rest until you reconcile with that person that you're mad at or who you know is mad at you? Can you do that, church? I want that for you, for the glory of God and for the joy of our family. Second, uh, let's consider the, the ministry to the church in Antioch. Now, news of massive Gentile conversion to Christ in Antioch, uh, them responding to the gospel, that news reached the church in Jerusalem. And so the Jerusalem church was like, man, what's going on in Antioch, right? And so they sent Barnabas to go and check it out. And they sent Barnabas to do two things. First, Barnabas went to evaluate. Verse 23 says that Barnabas came and he saw the evidence of the grace of God. So Barnabas went to evaluate the work that was going on in, in Antioch to, 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 um, uh, to, uh, to make sure that it was a real and genuine work of the Holy Spirit, that the gospel that was being preached and the gospel that was being believed was, was sound and it was true to the apostolic gospel and that, it was, uh, that the gospel was producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the lives of these new Gentile believers. So the first reason for Barnabas' visit was to evaluate what was happening in the church of Antioch. But secondly, and more importantly, Barnabas was sent to encourage. Verse 23 says that Barnabas, when he saw their faith in Christ, he was glad. And what did he do? And he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with a steadfast purpose, right? So Barnabas saw their faith, saw that it was genuine. He was overjoyed by that, and he encouraged them to continue to walk with Christ with, his, with their whole hearts. You know, I think about young Christians and young churches. Uh, yes, on the one hand, they need more older, established believers to come and, and to evaluate and, and to... Um, uh, uh, and to make sure that things are done soundly and according to a sound doctrine. But more importantly, young Christians and young churches need encouragement and affirmation from older, wiser, loving, and nurturing believers. Right? They need that. And in verse 24, Luke noted what kind of man Barnabas was. He says simply, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith. You know, as I was preparing the sermon, that phrase struck me, right? Barnabas was known as being a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And I, and I began to realize, what am I known for? And I began to really like, desire deeply in my heart, God, let that be true of me. Let, let me be a man that, that is known as, as, as being a good man, a man full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And right now I want to talk to the other pastors in the room and, and to the elders of our church. Brothers, this is what we ought to, to long to become. And this is what our church wants us to be, good men, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. Not gifted men full of pride and ambition, but good men full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And what does it mean to be full of the Holy Spirit? To be 
It means that we're under the influence and the control of the Holy Spirit. We're, we're bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The meaning in our lives, we're producing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. We're producing these beautiful things. And what does it mean to be full of faith? It means that we are believing and resting in all the promises of God, and we're going to help others to believe and rest in all the promises of God by our example. That's what it means. So Christ Central family, would you pray for me and for all the other pastors and for the elders of our church that we would be like Barnabas, good men, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Amen? We long to be that for you. We do. So pray for us. And because of Barnabas' ministry of encouragement, even more people were added to the Lord, according to verse 24. And as the ministry in Antioch grew too fast and too big, Barnabas realized he could not do all the work on his own. So what did he do? He left Antioch for a time, went to Tarsus, and he looked for Saul, because he, or, or for the apostle Paul, because he had heard that he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he was working with Gentiles. And so he, when he found Paul, he brought him back to Antioch, and what did they do? For a whole year... They did team ministry, and they ministered the gospel to the Gentiles in the church of Antioch together. I love Barnabas' humility and kingdom-mindedness. You know, if Barnabas wanted to make himself feel important in ministry, then, you know, he would have found anyone else but Paul to come work with him, right? Paul was far more gifted, and eventually we will learn that Paul will outshine Barnabas. What's interesting is right now, when you see Barnabas and Paul together, Barnabas' name comes first. But there's a shift in a few chapters where it begins to be Paul and Barnabas. See, if Barnabas wanted ministry to be about him and for his, and, and for his ego and for his need to be needed, he wouldn't have invited a gifted person like Paul to come labor with him where he would have to take second seat. But because Barnabas was about the glory of Christ, because he was about the kingdom of God, because he was about the good of the Antioch church, he invited Paul, who would become the greatest of all the apostles in terms of his contribution to gospel ministry. You do realize the apostle Paul wrote about half of the New Testament. No one did more for the kingdom uh, than Paul. But it was Barnabas's humble and gracious invitation to Paul to come to Antioch that gave Paul his start in ministry. And not only his start in ministry where Barnabas was willing to say, I will take second seat to you so that you can lead and do what God has called you to do and to be as the apostle to the Gentiles. Don't you love Barnabas' humility and kingdom-mindedness and his willingness to work on a team? To make it all about Jesus and not about himself. So Barnabas and Saul ministered as a team. They collaborated for a whole year uh, to the church in, uh, uh, church in Antioch. And the result of their team ministry was this. That in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, we don't know the content of Barnabas's and Saul's ministry to the church in Antioch. But we do know the fruit of their teaching. The result of their teaching, the result was this, that they produced disciples who loved Christ. They produced disciples who were devoted to Christ, who were loyal to Christ. They produced disciples who were publicly and unashamedly willing to confess that Christ was their Lord and not Caesar. And that was a very radical confession. Because everyone in the Roman Empire at that time was supposed to say Caesar was Lord. But these disciples, no, no, no. Not Caesar. Christ is Lord. In other words, they produced very Christ-centered disciples. So much so that they came to be known as Christians. You know, just as those who were publicly uh, devoted to and loyal to Herod were nicknamed what? Herodians. So those who were publicly devoted and publicly loyal to Christ, came to be nicknamed as Christians. And the name Christian, the nickname Christian, was not a name that Christians gave to themselves. It was a name that the citizens of Antioch said, hey, you guys seem to be talking about Jesus all the time. You're confessing that Christ is Lord, therefore we're going to call you Christians. So the people in Antioch knew 
who the Christians were by their personal and public confession and conduct. So Christ Central, I want to ask you this. Do the people in your workplace know that you are a Christian by your public and personal confession and conduct? Or do you try to keep it on the DL at work, right? And no one knows that you're a Christian. And if so, why? What are you afraid of? Why do you not want others to know that you're not that you're a Christian? You have to think about that, don't you? So Barnabas and Paul provided ministry to the church in Antioch. Lastly and quickly, let's see the ministry that came from the church in Antioch. Now a prophet named Agabus, Agabus predicted that a great famine would come and that it would devastate, it would really hit hard the Christian brothers and sisters in Judea. And so this new, young church in Antioch decided to take up a love offering uh, for the church in Jerusalem. And everyone in this church gave according to their ability. And they sent this financial gift that they amassed together to the Jewish church by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And one of the beautiful fruits of spiritual maturity and vitality is financial generosity. I want you to think about this. The Jewish church in Jerusalem had sent Barnabas to the Gentile church in Antioch to bless them spiritually. And now the Gentile church in Antioch was sending Barnabas back to the Jewish church in Jerusalem to bless them materially. The church in Antioch had received ministry and now they're giving ministry Ministry was coming from this new young church in Antioch. Now, though the church in Jerusalem was entirely Jewish, though the people in the church in Antioch did not, have, did, did, did not know the people in the church in Jerusalem personally, there's no personal connection there. And yet, they considered them brothers, according to verse 29. And when the church in Antioch had heard that their brothers in the Lord were going to suffer terribly from this famine, they generously and they sacrificially gave according to their ability to send relief to their brothers. Because they realized they're in the same family of God now. And this generous financial gift was further proof and evidence of the beautiful reconciliation that happened between redeemed Jews and redeemed Gentiles. You know that true reconciliation has happened when you can joyfully and sacrificially part with your money to bless the person that you were once at odds with. You know you can't give people money at least joyfully if you're still mad at them. <laughs> it's only when you've been truly reconciled in the Lord that you can joyfully and generously and sacrificially give to the people you once hated, but you now love in the Lord. The gospel produced not only a church with both redeemed Jews and redeemed Gentiles in Antioch, but it even produced unity and solidarity between two churches that were so different. The fully Jewish church in Jerusalem and the mixed-race Jew-Gentile church in Antioch. And there was a connection and a partnership between these two churches. Now, at the end of every sermon, I usually give a so what. And what that means is I try to give you one or two things uh, so that in ways that the sermon can make a difference in your life personally, right? But today I want to share with you kind of a big so what uh, for the entire sermon series. So after we're done studying the book of Acts, after we're done studying the early church in the book of Acts, what's the big difference I want to see happen in the life of our church? And here's... The big so what? Lord willing, I want our church to plant a daughter church in Tyson's. That's the big so what for this entire sermon series through the book of Acts. You know, the elders, the staff, the pastors, and I, we're praying that because we have studied and internalized the book of Acts, uh, because we have come to better understand what it means to truly be the church, that our whole church, not just the leaders of our church, but every member of our church will become more eager and more excited about planting a church in Tyson's. 
Our prayer and our desire is for unchurched and de-churched people who live or work in Tysons to hear the gospel and to believe the gospel. You know, there are people, so many people who need to hear that God exists, that God loves them in Christ, that God offers them forgiveness for all of their sins in Christ, that God has the power to change and to renew their lives. There are people who need to hear that this broken, ugly, fallen world is not all that there is, but there is a new and a better world which is to come. A world without sin, a world without sickness, a world without suffering, a world without injustice, a world without death. There are people who need to hear this precious, precious message of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and of the kingdom of God. And for that to happen, we need people to go to Tyson's and to share the gospel with the people who live or work in Tyson's, just as men from Cyprus and Cyrene had to go to Antioch and share the gospel with the Gentiles who lived and worked in Antioch. Pastor Peter and Jane, his wife, have sensed the call from the Lord Jesus to go to Tyson's and to preach the gospel there and to start a new Christ-centered church there. And it's an exciting kingdom advancing work that they're being called to. But Christ Central, do you realize that they cannot do this alone? They need people to go with them, to do team ministry with them, just as Saul and Barnabas did team ministry together in Antioch. And just as the church in Antioch needed older, wiser, loving, nurturing believers to come to help mature and disciple the, the new and young believers in Antioch, so the church in Tysons will need older, wiser, spiritually mature, loving, and nurturing believers from our church to go to help uh, nurture and disciple the new and young believers that we believe will be there in Tysons. You see, the church in Jerusalem was willing to send their very best. They sent Barnabas, one of their best. I want you to think about Barnabas. Do you know who Barnabas was in the life of the Jew Jerusalem church? He's the one that sold his property and gave all the proceeds to help uh, take care of the poor in the Jerusalem church. Barnabas was the pillar in the Jerusalem church. And then was like, no, no, we can't send Barnabas. I mean, he, we love Barnabas here. Send anyone else. You can't send Barnabas. But they sent Barnabas. And Barnabas didn't go for like two weeks. He went for over a year. The Jerusalem church was willing to send their very best for over a year to bless the church in Antioch. And in the same way, Christ Central, Centerville, can we send our very best people to go and be a blessing to the people in Tyson's, to help share the gospel there, to help nurture and mature and disciple new believers in Tyson's? Can we send our very best? So if something like that interests you, I want to encourage you, no matter who you are, would you please start praying about it and talk to Pastor Peter. He'll be available to talk to you after the service. We have, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we have a Christ Central Tyson's table in the foyer. And he's there every Sunday after every service, happy to talk with anybody about joining him on this mission. And so talk to him, get your name on the email list, start getting notifications, and you can begin to pray about whether God might be calling you to be a part of this new gospel work in Tyson's. And so, Christ Central, my prayer and my hope is that after this sermon series, we will have a team of believing men and women who are ready to leave with Pastor Peter and Jane to go to Tyson's to help start a new gospel-centered church there. That's the dream. And friends, if that's the big, so what? If that's the big difference I can make in the life of our church, then we can glorify, praise, and thank God together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, um, thank you for being the one who planted this church. And, for, and you built this church and you grew this church. And we're so grateful that you did. And we pray that you would do it again. Would you plant and start and build another church in Tyson's for your glory and for the people and for the joy of the people who live and work in Tyson's. Amen. Let's all rise.